Welcome everyone. So this is the fourth week of the Anthropocene from despair to active hope journey. We've, uh, we've, it's been such a rich journey, really. Um, we've been blessed with so many amazing people and conversations. Um, and if you haven't caught up, that's fine. Take your time. I've been sending all the recordings on email, so take your time with it. These are conversations that require time. You can't um, force your way through them. So um, take your time and welcome back. Happy to see familiar faces. Um, so today we have Meena, Meena Subramaniam, whose work I have admired for a very long time. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Meena, I'm very honored for you to be here today. And just also really appreciating how um, you are so open to it and said, I've never done this before, but I'm coming. And I really appreciate that. Um, and I have to say that the first time I saw one of your paintings was in um, Earthlines magazine when Suprabha's um, oh, yes. um, um, music of everything got published. It was a UK magazine that doesn't exist anymore. That's right. It was their last issue. Um, and so that was, I think, in 2012 or... Yes. Yeah. Um, you mean they've stopped publishing now? Earthlines has stopped? Yes. That's that really sad. sad. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, since then I've really been following uh, Mina's work and admiring it. And so happy to have her here. And um, I would just do a formal introduction, just read out uh, Mina's bio, and, and then we will start the conversation. So Meena Subramaniam is a nature and conservation artist who lives near the Peria Tiger Reserve. Her work has been featured in several magazines, including Sanctuary Asia, the Indian Quarterly with the ecologist and writer Superbisation in the Dark Mountains and the Mark Ish Issue Arts, Arts Botanica. She's also the recipient of the 2018 TN Kushu Memorial Award for pioneering work in ecological art in 2018. She has recently made a small contribution of illustrations to the Trees of Arunachal Pradesh and a poster for CF on fruit dispersal by frugivores birds of Pake Forest in Arunachal Pradesh. Her preferred medium is acrylic on canvas and occasionally watercolors. So welcome, Nina. Uh, we have a small group here today. I hope more people join, but um, it doesn't matter. I, I have realize that it doesn't affect the quality of the conversation. So. No, it doesn't. And anyway, it's on YouTube. So, you know, people who missed it probably will, because I've missed all the previous ones, except Suprabha's. Yeah. Because I had family here and there was no way I could sit down for a meal to listen to all these amazing speakers. So, you know, it, it's fine. I mean, you know. So, um. You know, the first question or prompt that I have for you, Mina, is that, uh, and I think we touched upon that a bit before also, is that yeah. your paintings are so full of life. I mean, life is just, you could, it's just coming out of the canvas, you know, and there's such colors and vivid life, nature. Um, but I also know that you're someone who feels very deeply for the earth and who, who's really affected by what's happening right now so I, I really wanted to kind of you know start with that deep conversation but just to how how does it happen okay um I always wanted to paint and draw but I you know in uh, when I went when I finished school I was actually pretty good in art but uh, mm -hmm. some of family wouldn't allow me to leave Bangalore and go elsewhere to study art and all this patriarchal stuff uh, but I used to keep doodling and, you know, doing all that. And then at some point, when I started growing a lot of plants in Kodi, I lived in the Palni Hills for a long time. Um, uh, those days, you know, we had no access to botanical art or YouTube videos or any of this kind of stuff. It was just not there. I mean, you know, so I would just doodle a bit. And then we used to get this American Orchid Society bulletin every month. So I used to look at these wonderful watercolors and botanicals and I used to feel so jealous because I wanted to paint like that, uh, which is very, very difficult. And it, it uh, that requires a certain kind of discipline. Personally, I don't think I have it. Um, 
So at some point, I was also wondering how to do these really huge canvases. With, that came much later because uh, later I moved near Peria Tiger Reserve and I was doing little canvases and I was managing to sell a few and people would come and say, oh, this is very nice. Can I have it? And I was obsessed with painting owls and doing pen and ink sketches. And most people would say very nice because they all want gifts. You know, and I've heard this from many artists that, you know, everybody is looking for a gift. Hey, will you give it to me as a gift? Why don't you give it to me? This kind of thing. Then at some point, I think around 2012, 2011, I got into my head that I wanted to do really huge paintings. It was just something in me, like, you know, it was something that I constantly fantasized and built up in my mind that I would one day do really huge paintings, uh, not small things and everything, because what I dreamt of, what my thing was, to, was to capture as much as I could of this, the sheer grandeur of nature, you know, the sheer grandeur of the Western Ghats, and then much later, even Arunachal Pradesh and the Northeast. So for me, it was just the sheer grandeur. The fact that you can look in any nook and corner and there is like life teeming everywhere. And uh, I never looked back after that. You know, I mean, one does do uh, mediocre work too. But then as an artist, if you're using your imagination, you should be open to that. You should be open to the fact that not every painting is a classic. I mean, it's basically, you know, it, it is just something that you have to be very humble about and accept that you can't do every painting like a masterpiece. You know, so yeah, that's how it all started. And uh, I keep going on like, you know, I mean, I finish one painting and then I'm already thinking what I want to paint next. So, yeah. And so do you do you spend uh, how uh, do you spend time? So do you see, OK, this is what I want to paint. And do you spend time in that place? And then capture it on canvas or how yeah, see what usually happens is when I'm traveling, like I usually go for birding in Northeast or if I go somewhere very, ex very, very beautiful in the Western Ghats is I take a lot of photographs because I'm not a good bird photographer and things like this. I, I, I simply can't imagine lugging one of these huge cameras around and things. So I just carry a little camera and I take photographs of all the plants that I can find. Then I make little notes, you know, I also talk to myself and I make some notes of what I saw and what was very important there and things like this. And because my plant knowledge is not so bad, uh, when I come back, I try to compose something using these things, you know, like, uh, for example, I'm, I find flocks and the diversity of bird flocks in the Northeast extremely, very, very interesting. Um, and uh, it's just a way of capturing what I think are the most beautiful aspects of a rainforest or an evergreen forest. So that's what I do. Like most of the time I don't do no, I don't do sketches at all. Not anymore. I just draw straight onto the canvas and I start painting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, so from what I have seen, and I've not seen all of your uh, paintings, there's always also water. Yeah, there's birds, uh, plants, and there's water. This is the, I mean, there's a diversity amongst all of that, but these are the three elements I often find uh, in your paintings. Um, so, Mina, um, you, uh, you once told me that, you know, yes, my paintings are full of joy, Lakshmi, but there's a wellspring of grief underneath. Yes. Um, when I look at how, you know, when we talk about this element called water, uh, this I, I associate a lot of my personal grief, my ecological grief with that, because there's such abuse of water, which is a natural resource. There is such abuse of, you know, when water comes down from one tiny spring in some little grassland. And then, you know, as it makes its way towards the sea, it gathers, it gathers momentum. There's so many other little streams and rivulets that join it. So many other little parts that make it into that one big throbbing river which, you know, which just roar, rages on in monsoon and all around it gives and sustains life. And these are the same, this, the same element is so abused by humans, you know. Uh, there's just no, there's nothing sacred or, the you know, a feeling of let's treat it as something really sacred, attached to water, just like there isn't for earth or air, you know. 
Uh, so this is one of the reasons why, I mean, I, uh, there have been times when I've done this recurring, recurring themes of water and especially waterfalls, uh, because there's something so beautiful about waterfalls. When you look at waterfalls, which are flowing down and thundering down on both sides, there are, there's always unique vegetation. There's so much life around a waterfall, even though it's raging, you know, and the same waterfall then becomes a stream and around it are so many little creatures that are feeding on it. There are animals that depend on it. And then, you know, humans, of course, I mean, we, we depend on this. And at the same time, we abuse it so much. You know, we don't really think about treating it with respect. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, I composed a few with water because I, it came from a place of deep ecological grief. <clears throat> Um, and uh, I mean, when you were traveling and looking for inspirations, have you come across landscapes that were degraded uh, that you thought you could um, just are there any stories from your travels that you felt, OK, I need to paint this, but maybe I'll give it life? Um, yeah, like I remember the last time I'd gone to the Mishmi Hills, I, I think it was 2000 and. 16, I think 2016 or 2017. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful areas in India. It should have been preserved as is where is. There was no need to go and meddle in it, but then they started these, they started this road work and they just destroyed both sides of the road. And wherever this road is going, it's just complete decimation of everything. And as this decimation continues, um, there are a lot of dry, spe dry land species and exotics which are moving. Um, things that you would never see before in the Mishmis because the first time I went there was in 2008, I think, 2008 or 2009. And it was pristine. I think there were only five outsiders there and one of them was me. And, uh, you know, suddenly I go there in 2016 and... It's not bird watchers and people who are interested in nature are coming. It's like there is this serious presence of people who have just come to just party in the Mishmi Hills. And it's, um, you know, and then there is this whole thing with these roads, which are creating so much. They've created so much destruction. Uh, what like, you know, common species that you find in the Northeast and also extending into Thailand, like, uh, uh, you know, Taka, there is one which is called the bat flower. There were, there were mountainsides clothed in it. It was just clothed with vegetation. This is all dried out because they've just blasted helter skelter to build this road and chopped so many trees and disturbed so much with this dynamiting and everything uh, that I came back and I thought, no, I want to do these two paintings, Garden of the Gods. I think part two is the one I sent you uh, for me, which is like... Um, it's representative of a paradise without humans. I'm, I'm just going to share my screen and, and show this particular yeah. thing that um, she's talking about. So this is mid-elevation of the Mishmi Hills. And there is this very pink flower on the side, which you see, which is grown like a spike. That's a newly discovered uh, species of Lysianthus. I think when I, came, when I was there, I had taken photographs of it. And, you know, it was a dried seed. I had taken a photo of it. And when I came back, I, when I was doing a little research on some photos of uh, plants that I had taken, I discovered, I found out that it was recently discovered. It was discovered like three months before. So, and this was bang on the roadside. So what are we really doing with this road building and, you know, all this when species are just being discovered by roadsides, new species? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, uh, so you can see that it, for me, it is, it's, it's just, I'm beyond anger now. It's more like uh, completely like, you know, let's take this and let's make it something really beautiful. Of course, a client, or a, a girl, somebody I know commissioned me to do, paint this. But my thing was like, she said, I just want lots of birds. And I said, no, I want to paint the Mishmi Hills for you. And I'll put in as many birds as I can. So it's a bit of a crowded canvas with all the birds. But the, that particular elevation, these are the things that you find. So I had to, you know, I had to simply paint them. Oh, I um, I mean, when you speak, I feel like, you know, you say I had to simply paint them. So there's some other 
something else speaking through you as you say i just had to pick the uh the hills maybe um and mina you had sent me a few others um if, if you like i can show those paintings and you can sure. talk a little bit about them okay so this is my kind of ode to the you know the high ranges and the grasslands of munnar and palni hills uh because they are high elevation grasslands and as they come down there are all these beautiful birds and everyone who's kind of what do you say um admiring the water that's flowing and admiring the waterfall and they are an audience and a very appreciative audience to the grasslands which are high up above and i've also added uh, an exotic there which is the zypomia uliflora uh you know the purple flowers because yeah. they are now become very common place in the in uh, most of uh, most uh, um areas which have become disturbed you see this uliflora everywhere uh it's taking over you know it's growing all over kodi hills is is is, is like clothed in it everywhere you find it it's very pretty it's very nice but the point is that i mean it is an exotic and uh, though i have no problems with the plant i just often wonder why aren't the you know indigenous flora more represented there than you uh, you know this particular thing but it's something that i associate very much with the high ranges this particular flower you know it is a beautiful flower yes it is it's a very beautiful flower so are lots of other flowers <laughs> and these yellow flowers are also very pretty yeah those are titonias that are those are native and common you know they native and common they do weed around but it's much better to have them around than many other weedy colonizers you know yeah forest friends actually is one of my earliest works uh i think i had finished this painting and it got published in nagio some e magazine that they had um it's got some native plants because for the first time i attempted drawing impatiens which are those orange flowers uh it was actually impatien verticillata and then there is monstera those big leaves at the back and these white flowers small white flowers are all um uh, tambergia fragrans which is also a native but on the side i put a trumpet of the datura you know the datura's trumpet because now that's also a complete exotic and it's completely taking over landscapes uh it's everywhere now you know and though i do love them i absolutely love daturas uh i'm i'm just quite tired of seeing them everywhere you know they they've been uh, they suppress a lot of forest growth and they come up um these are of course the racket tail drongos which are very common where i live and i have always found them extremely fascinating and i think they are very beautiful birds so it was just a painting i did you know i just composed it and i painted it in about a month straight from the heart because i really wanted to paint these things together very much and it's very old it's a, maybe i did it in 2014 or 12 or something like this i noticed the owl sitting there <laughs> the like a bit of like <laughs> it's very beautiful this is actually i had made a visit to um um you know that part of area near simla and all these places i had gone there and uh, it was fantastic to bird there because i i i was fascinated with these uh, red bill blue magpies i thought they were just the most amazing birds and uh, you know and these are all there are lots of gardens in this area people have planted lot of gardens so there are a lot of exotics and then i discovered there was one passiflora exotic also growing there and it looked very beautiful because you know there were so many birds around it and of course these uh, these two magnificent these uh, magnificent uh, red bill blue magpies so i just did a composition and i painted all of them together you know yeah, yeah. that's beautiful actually it was kasauli uh, uh it was in kasauli yeah yes lots of people but uh, very little primary forest left um the birds seem to be happy but the thing is there's hardly any primary forest or natural vegetation left this is my last painting aya 
Okay, uh, there was three years of COVID, right? So I am kind of homesick for the northeast, but I am stuck with work, so I cannot go anywhere. So this is a flock fantasy, and it's a typical lower elevation uh, flock diversity, bird flock diversity. And I was just telling you about the Mishmi Hills, where this road blasting and road making is damaging things. These yeah. are the birds that you find in that area in very very high numbers, and they are dwindling because of habitat loss. Uh, we don't know how this is going to go because our low elevation birds and things going to move upwards. And if that starts happening, what is the fate of these guys? Um, I don't know. But uh, it's actually a very homesick painting. It's really I'm I'm kind of homesick for that area. <laughs> you know. Uh, well, that's what it is. It's basically I'm a, I mean, and there are these little berries at the bottom. Uh, that's an indigenous tree from the northeast, which a lot of birds feed on and they also disperse. They fruit disperse these trees. It's called micromelum. Um, and of course, they, these are all the birds that you find in one composite. In one area, you will find all of them together and maybe even more, you know, uh, because this was a small canvas of uh, three feet by four feet. I could only put this many. If I had a larger canvas, I would have put more. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I wish I could see the world through your eyes, Mira. Really. <laughs> I think it would be a very colorful world. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll stop the sharing there. Um, and perhaps we can open up the conversation because we've just got Supriya and Rukmini here with us right yeah. now. And I'm sure they have comments or reflections or questions. So, Nina, as you've been speaking, I've been, uh, you know, also reflecting on the term native and exotic and how that's yeah. playing out in our world right now, you know, with the migrant crisis and refugees. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it seems to be happening at every, every level of the ecosystem, including yeah. humans. And so there's this strange merger of species and races yeah. and... Uh, so on the one hand, uh, the, the, there is this sense of wanting to keep the indigenous intact and honor that. And at the same time, there is this, uh, uh, I don't know how, how to give space for the refugee, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. So, okay. yeah, I wonder how you hold that in your yeah. world. Yeah, uh, when it comes to this, when it comes to human migration and human migrants, uh, I think the world should be free of rid of all these borders. People should be able to move as and how they want. People always did, you know, before imperialism and colonialism, there was life on the planet. A uh, lot of history moved around. People did travel around. People went on foot. From here to there, carried bard stories. They brought back stories. They brought back also science and discoveries and foods and, you know. So when it comes to human migration, uh, I'm very pro that people should be able to go where they want and not be forced. I mean, in the sense like, for example, if I look at the Rohingya crisis, it is really unfair that they are being deprived of their homes. And I think everybody should open their arms and let them in and let them thrive and let their cultures grow. But when it comes to these exotics of birds and, you know, exotic insects and plants and animals, uh, no, I, I mean, I'm kind of quite against it. I mean, in the sense that it's a different thing when you have a garden and you keep exotic plants. But the minute it starts to escape into the wild, we really have a problem. Uh, Neil Grease is now, you know, lower elevations are covered in senna. The forest department thought it was a fantastic idea bringing senna. It was fine for some time and now it's all over the place. It's not allowing indigenous plants to thrive. It's not allowing them to grow. Um, the same thing with eucalyptus and wattle. There is hardly any grassland left now in the high ranges because every grassland, wattle has come in, pine has come in, eucalyptus has come in. You know, so this is displacing, uh, you know, like indigenous birds like Nilgri pipit. It's running out of its habitat. There is nothing for it. 
it's just going to die with the last meal making a plaintive call because you know everything else is died out because there's nothing to eat and there's nowhere to go because there are no grasslands left uh it's the same thing with the nail green tar it is not an animal which is meant to be in a shola forest or in an evergreen forest it's supposed to be on grassland it's a grass and cliff plant a uh, cliff hanger uh if you're going to have eucalyptus and wattle and all this growing there where does this mammal go uh this is kind of what i would call as wanton extinction where uh, you know it's like the average tourist who takes a bus and travels through kodaikanal or uti or somewhere looks at a very um what do you call it orderly pine plantation and says oh this is a beautiful forest when actually there is zero biodiversity there you know whereas when humans migrate we are carrying biodiversity with us uh in the sense of our foods you know the foods that we eat and we are also carrying you know we are sharing something and our histories with another group of humans which i cannot say the same for you know animals or plants or um uh, you know uh, birds or any of these you know uh there's also been like a couple of times i've seen now on the internet that people just release um aquarium fish they don't want an aquarium fish anymore it's an exotic they release it into into you know into rivers and streams that's displacing our own native uh fish uh where do they go what happens to them i mean introducing catfish in a freshwater pond pond where there are indigenous uh, fish catfish eat everything there's nothing for these indigenous fish there's nothing for um, you know for stocks and for water birds to eat because they can't eat catfish so when you look at this i think human mig- humans and their migrations and humans creating migration of other species are completely two different things i just um, i feel a bit cheeky but I also see how lovingly you've painted them as well, Mina, in your <laughs> composition. They look so beautiful and part of the uh, ecosystem. Just to, just to, I'm just being cheeky. Now. <laughs> Any other questions or? I have something to uh, ask. Uh, I I see that you you uh, you have an understanding of taxonomy, and somehow you uh, manage to. Uh, bring in that bit which enhances the beauty of the painting uh, usually i observe that when uh, one enters the sort of drab world of taxonomy you sort of miss on the forest experience and i have also been working on this on how does my um, understanding of science or biodiversity as a science uh, also enhance the experience of the forest sometimes it sort of uh, makes you divide uh, the experience into different uh, pockets i would say you know grouping them and saying yeah. this is different from other whereas yeah. when i look at your painting it looks like a whole in itself but still you manage to say that oh look at that bird and look at this bird and then you suddenly start seeing them as individuals as well but in the painting i could see them they all are together i think that's the magic you have in your brush so i would like to you know thank really you so understand. much that's such a wonderful compliment thank actually, you actually i did not study taxonomy or anything i did science in college uh but actually i taught myself a bit of botany and then i started reading a lot on ecology and plants and some taxonomy and just brushing up even now if i if i forget something i just go back and i brush up on it um you know and yes for me i mean if i was given a choice i would put insects i would put in snakes i would put everything in those paintings uh but the problem is that when i put when i put insects and snakes a lot of my clients don't like it they say it frightens them so it's like you know but what to do i mean we have to compromise somewhere you know but i look forward that one day i will be able to create those kind of paintings where even indigenous snakes and indigenous you know specific butterflies from that area their larvae the the birds everything can be together the animals you know all of them could come together in one composite i would love to do it which means i need a very huge canvas but that's fine like you know the bigger the better <laughs> wow and how about your journey of you know understanding them as uh, through the plant taxonomy or taxonomy perspective and then connecting it with your art background 
See, the thing is, I am a gardener. I mean, if I wasn't painting, I would be gardening. I would have run a plant nursery or something and been gardening because I love gardening. And uh, when I lived in the Palni Hills, I started to grow a lot of the native plants because, you know, they would be doing some highway repair works and they would be damaging the sides. So I'd go and collect all those water ferns and everything and give them a home in my garden. So this way I made quite a large collection. I had a huge collection of ferns and orchids and things, you know, because I used to just collect some potato farmer will tell me there's Pectylus Susanne growing there. I'm digging the roots out. So I used to go there and get the plants and then plant them somewhere in a grassland, you know. So this is something I just did because I think it's a, I think for a lot of humans, if you're close to nature, if you really love nature, you will do it anyway. You know, it's uh, the people who have kind of separated themselves from nature for whatever reason, like, you know, maybe very uh, high, highly urbanized lifestyle or they haven't really had a chance to be with nature. Anyone would do this is my feeling. And this is what I'm very positive about. I like to be a little optimistic that younger and younger people who are going to be living closer to nature uh, will be able to just take care of these things, you know, not to just kill something just because it's creepy and crawly and, you know, not just to mindlessly kill a snake because it's poisonous or these kind of things. I think those things are really important because several individuals doing this for parts of biodiversity can become a huge movement without even defining it as a movement because they've just made it a part of their daily practice to always help to, to you know, there's a lava on, you know, on the curry leaf plant and it's, uh, it's a butterfly that's going to feed on it. You just leave it alone. You make sure it's okay, you know, so that its life cycle can go on. I think in these kind of, I feel somehow that these small things done by many individuals can have a, very powerful effect because we are actually protecting at least parts of nature. We may not be able to do much about dams and, you know, all these big things, but at least around us, we are trying to look after whatever we can. Thank you. Thanks, Meena. I had a question. How is it living close to the Piria Tiger Reserve? Nothing. This has just become another ghetto. It's, uh, there's development everywhere. People are building, all that stuff is going on. I mean, and the kind of phenomenal spraying that goes on in Iniki district for cardamom is, it's frightening, you know. But what is very nice is like, I can just go through the Periyar gate and then I forget this thing exists. It is still a very nice place to live. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's a very nice place. I mean, it has one of the finest air qualities in the country because sometimes I look, check air quality Kumli with Bangalore. And it's like, this is, you know, it's like, if it's even sometimes it's even better than Kodekinan or Munar because it's just clean air. Uh, the other thing is, of course, it's really nice being close to Periyar because anytime I want, I can just go and walk. And when I'm walking in the forest, I don't really have to, I forget that this thing exists, you know, the outside exists. That's, that's one of the things. And of course, it's quite central in the sense, Ilki district itself has Munar, it's got... Pambadam Shola, it's got all these places close by. So you can always go for a walk somewhere or you can take a, you can go there and you can go around or you can do something. Yeah, it's good. I, I, I chose to live here, you know. I chose to live here. I mean, I really enjoy living here and painting because whatever it is, it's still a very quiet place. <clears throat> you know, there's not much of a social life or anything, no distractions because there's nothing happening here. You know, there's really nothing happening here. It's like, and it's brilliant because either you go into the forest and you walk and you bird and you do your thing and do you, whatever you want to do, you know, observing animals, whatever, and you come out and then there is really nothing unless you're really focused on painting or your garden or whatever, there is really nothing to do here. So a lot of people come here and say, there's nothing here. And I'm like, right, that's why I live here. Because there's nothing here, you know. There's only birds and mammals and all this. And I mean, a lot of people don't want that. They want other things. So anyway. Do you paint mammals? I have uh, the Sanctuary magazine cover. Did I send it to you? No, I don't. Uh, Neil Green Martin? No. 
uh, how do I? Uh, well, can you... Okay, maybe I'll I'll send it to them on an email later. Yeah, yeah, it's there. I will. I can send it to you on email. I think I have it on my phone, but I can post it later. Like I can send it to you. So I did a cover for Sanctuary magazine with the Neil Green Martin. uh and uh, basically just pamba shola because uh, for many years i was involved with the you know the unilever's mercury thermometer factory issue in kodi i worked on that for many years so i'm sort of very committed to be anti industrial pollution and that you know pollution control board should be a little more aware they should become citizen oriented more and citizen should be participating in them uh to bring these guys to book and keep them in control uh so this basically this was a painting i did out again out of very deep grief um they they lost about 11.4 tons of elemental mercury all discharged into pambar shola and uh this is nilgiri martin habitat uh there is a lot of endemism there with plants and all that water is going through pambar shola and it is going into tamil nadu's aquifers all along the vaiga vaiga basin so which means like districts like periyukulam teeni all their ground water has got mercury in it because it's not one year of pollution it's 18 odd years of mercury contamination um so you know i i when uh, when i was asked whether i would like, asked if i could design the cover i said yes i would like to paint this because people should really know what this means you know i mean maybe pamba shola doesn't have a resident star species as a tiger but nilgiri martens are also very highly endangered there are only roughly around 2000 of them on the planet and uh, you know so it was my it was from grief that i painted it you know saying you know you just discharged all this how is it going to affect these martens because they are feeding on reptiles reptiles are feeding on uh some other creatures that are feeding on water and then that water is with mercury it just goes on and on and on and now it's completely in the food chain and who's taking responsibility for this plus we have climate change on our heads and we've got exotics like himalayan cherry and all these plants floating around inside the shola that they don't cull so who's taking responsibility for this you know um I wonder sometimes where is the hope for this? You know, when in the sense like when thousands of people die because of climate change induced factors uh, or a tsunami or something, we all mourn. But a couple of nilgiri martens dying quietly inside the forest of you know kidneys gone or something. Who even knows? Who even cares? Who even mourns? You know? Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to be depressing, but really, I mean, I like to ask these questions. You know, if there was a space that was open to this, is definitely this one <laughs> for sure. Um, th- thank you for sharing that. I mean, and that's that's definitely. And I'm still, I'm still amazed. I'm sure if I see that painting of the Nilgiri Martin, it would be full of joy and life. So there's, I I I feel that this is my take on it, Mina. Is that somehow you're able to take that grief and really alchemically transform it to some some form of active hope yes uh, because i do believe that one has to keep hoping one has to always believe that things are going to get better because there are new generations of humans coming in not every one of them is stupid you know there are a lot of young people asking questions who are very committed to um different kinds of lifestyles who are very committed to using less who really care about plan the planet they care about humans too so there must be always some hope uh and the other thing is you know doing depressing paintings and depressing drawings it just makes people feel more depressed because there's already enough depressing stuff on the planet i mean yesterday was that you know so many years since bopal they never got any justice how come they are doing it they are living in hope so why can't we live in hope you know entire generations of them got poisoned and it's a minority community and very poor minority community most of them you know they've seen suffering all their lives there are children born even today who are born 
with bad, you know bad uh, mental problems or limb problems or you know the after effects of this of bhopal uh, the chemical uh, uh, you know the leak um, how come they have hope why don't we have hope you know we need to have that hope too because they are carrying on with that hope so when i see people who are really victims um managing to keep their hopes up and not killing themselves you know all together and they keep going after 38 years after 48 years then i wonder why are we not doing it so that's where i transmute my grief into something which is pleasurable you know to the to the human eye yeah thank you and that's a that's a very a very nuanced understanding of uh, of that and i think i very recently um kind of touched upon that a little bit um with two two distinct um instances and i can share here because this group um uh, i feel very open to is the one i was in uh, chatra recently in central india in jharkhand yeah this, um we were in this uh, mining area open open cut uh, coal mines you know this uh it was quite hard to be there and then we met this man who right. was leading movements and campaigns against and and he said something like you know andolan he said you know like every andolan i have led has failed <laughs> and he said that with such uh and he said people do more uh and i really i had this feeling that the andolan has failed but he hasn't no he hasn't you know and there is such in he there's something about standing your truth uh and and doing what is right doesn't yeah. matter, you know uh, and i felt the same thing when i recently i was in the um rivers for life exhibition in asim prem ji in bangalore and nandini oza had um she was releasing this book um which is the oral histories of two indigenous elders during the movement who were there during the movement and one of them had come and he was asked this question how do you feel because it was a failure uh the narmada movement was a failure and there was not a shred of doubt even when he said yeah the dam was built but we were not defeated yeah you know life was not defeated and 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 you know the body and the, the way they um i i just there was something I, i'm having goosebumps now because there was such learning for me in that to to this is how we go on yeah you know and it's the only way to go on you know <clears throat> this is the only way to go on i mean the water is going into kutch why the hell would the ram of kutch which is a desert kind of a ecosystem why do you need water there where is the need to go there and, but this is industrial civilization this is how it works this is how it operates and uh, it doesn't mean that we give up you know it doesn't mean that we stop we will do in our own ways you know and i think individual individually what we could do is also a lot and then when we come together as a collective and do together that becomes something else you know because individual self expression for me is very important uh, a cartoonist just like rohan chakravarti or that young lady who was on your you know on one of your uh, yeah poor webinars um the way they express themselves um is individual self expression against something you know about something it's their commentary on something um but when we come together as a collective it becomes a very strong thing because different people are bringing different elements into it and creating something which is uh, which is which can go on it's something that's solid then you know yeah thank you meena and that is that's what this journey you know uh, when i when we mentioned active despair to active hope i want to yeah. that aspect in that um, the idea of hope that someone's going to fix it we have moved past that uh, and so uh, joanna macy gives a good example of this and she says you know if you see oh you it's you know your neighbor's house is burning and you know that it's burning and you're just sitting there going oh the fire engine's going to come soon you know someone would have called somebody and you're just sitting there you're worried but you're just sitting there um and then you keep seeing it burning you know and more and more 
at one point you move from oh someone's going to do go do something to i am going to go yeah and and that moment she describes as that's when you have active hope because you are yeah. active and you know that something will be done yeah you know and and we all have our own ways of reaching that point or how we express that yeah what we do how we do it it's all you know our own journeys but it's that point when we know that no one's going to come and make this right i have to do what i have to do yeah um, and lot of times you know uh, the thing i've realized also with climate changes i don't really socialize anymore i mean i meet very few people really because most people don't want to talk about it people say it's very depressing there is nothing depressing you know but like most people like to think or assume that oh let's not talk about climate change let's just keep going on mindlessly shopping and buying junk that we don't need and you know all the stuff that you don't need you don't really need it's on some whim you know i need to get one velvet dress i'll wear it once but then after that it's going into a landfill or it's going into a into the sea um so this kind of whim shopping and doing things on a whim there are a lot of people on the planet who do this and if you broach the subject of climate change the first thing they tell you is it's so depressing and then it's like yeah but it's not really depressing it's just reality and there are ways to deal with it you know first thing is stop buying things you don't need you know don't leave the water on when you brush your teeth you don't really need to do that but most people do that most people buy junk that they don't need oh there's a covid lockdown fine i'll go on amazon and i'll order things i'll never use just just because i must i have to do something with myself you know this there the, the most people are in this stage right now and um, i don't know when they will really snap out of it and start understanding that i don't really need to buy more than i know i have four pairs of shoes i don't need a 10th pair a 8th pair a 5th pair i mean how many pairs can you own you know um this kind of i don't know i think this kind of consciousness uh, comes with new generations i think you know um probably your generation and younger this kind of consciousness because in my generation it's still a very small percentage but it grows and grows because i see this fridays for future how many young people are out there there's a climate rally in chennai so many young people are taking part you know uh, uh greta thunberg is talking there are all these young people who want to be with her like you know who are all 12 13 15 uh they seem to have a better understanding of the climate and they're not depressed talking about it they're just very realistic i mean the kids are more grown up than the adults you know yeah thank you thank you meena you mentioned the uh, the climate rally in chennai i have a personal um i had this little moment my heart was like all flowering because years ago when i was 18 19 we had our little pluck cards five of us in on besant nagar beach <laughs> with you know nityan and jaram and the journalists and that was and now there are hundreds of young people there and it's the same yeah. group and 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 i was just suddenly had this thing of wow <laughs> you know the how how it has moved on so yes yeah or urur kutum and you know the whole thing that he started with native musicians being able to sing and kacheris and all i mean niti is absolutely brilliant you know and uh, young people now it's gone from strength to strength there's so many young people everywhere rallying together and saying yeah we are fighting this we're going to do this we're interested in the fishermen and the coastline you know let us breathe you're putting stuff into the no so you know into an or rash into the into the sea you're destroying destroying livelihoods more and more young people are coming out now saying we don't want this you know it's very very it's not even development anymore it's some sort of retarded idea of how things should be and even the people who are planning it don't have any clue what it's going to be it's just mindless you know it's just a mindless thing true uh just to give uh people who are probably yeah. listening to the recording a bit of reference to everything that was mentioned uh, let, uh, let me start with so there is the um um justice rocks music concerts that happen in chennai um every year 
um, that relates to justice and people's movement and, and uh, also about climate justice. Um, there is the Vettiver Collective um, that also is organizing the climate rally in Chennai um, just this weekend. Yeah, today, I think, or tomorrow. Um, and um, Meena also spoke about the mercury uh, dumping in Kore Canal which is a hill station in India. And there have been there were lots of protests and people's movements and even court cases that is still ongoing in Kode Canal. I didn't know about it happening in um where, where is the other place that you mentioned, or is it the same place? The I was talking about the mercury in Kode Canal. Yeah, yeah. In Kode Canal. Uh, and the Bhopal gas tragedy that happened in 1984 with the Union Carbide Factory um accident. And I believe both are Unilever, no? Uh, no, one is Union Carbide, the other is Unilever. One is Bio and the other is uh, Unilever. Yeah. Um, and yeah. every day there are these mini Bhopals all over the place in all third world countries. I mean, you look at Africa, the African continent. There is somebody getting poisoned, something terrible happening, some poor community getting displaced, losing their ecology, losing their livelihoods, their health because of some sort of transgression, some sort of terrible mistake, you know, by, by um, you know, some small employees of a multinational corporation. Um, so somewhere people have to, we have to keep going. We have to keep resisting. You know, we have to keep speaking up uh, simply because it's our job to speak up. You know, we have to do it. It's being responsible. It's being compassionate to speak up. Uh, because there are many people who are voiceless and and the uh, ecosystem is voiceless completely. You know, it only knows how to rebel by either, you know, some terrible fires happen or um, rains and floods or, you know, these kind of natural disasters. But individual species in an ecosystem really are completely voiceless. They have nothing. They can't speak for speak up for themselves. Little songbirds in the northeast of India where they're planning to do these oil palm plantations. What can they say? What, what, can, what can this bird say? You know, other than quietly go extinct, it has no other choice. You know, or fly off somewhere else where there is some forest and keep holding on to these little uh, niches until finally it comes even there. And then it's a complete wipeout. So we have to keep putting pressure. We have to keep saying, hey, no. You know, this caps it. We have to do something on, on this. And I try to do it with my art, you know. Many others do much, much more than I do. I'm a very small cog in the wheel. Uh, but yeah. Aren't we all, Meena? Yeah. <laughs> and your art speaks a lot. I think the strong word is definitely speaking to anyone who wants to listen through your art. So any more questions or comments? Anyone? If not, uh, Meena, just, I think, uh, just curious to know where the Babit is coming from. Is it Lakshmi's or Meena's place? I can hear a Babit. I have Babits here. Yes, so nice to listen to it. Yeah, I have uh, uh, just when she the Babit here. here. Yeah, yeah, I have Babits oh, here. We can hear it. Yeah, it's also joining our conversation. Yes, and I have cocoa. I have one cocoa tree here, and the cocoa beans are all for the barbets. Mm -hmm. I never pick the berries because they like to drill holes and eat it. And uh, you know, around uh, when I first moved here, there was a lot of biota. Now it's becoming this typical Bangalore kind of, you know, Madras kind of thing where people cut all their trees and they concrete and uh, concrete their cement, their uh, their lands, and then they just keep flowering pots. And keep saying we're keeping it clean, keeping it clean. There is some sort of association here with soil being dirty. And I'm probably the only house here which keeps my house a little woody and jungly because, I mean, I really like having a place for all these poor birds and birds to come and go. And I have a pair of mongoose in this little plot, which are just going to have babies. I think they've been, prop, uh, you know, wandering around. So I try to keep whatever comes into my land, I leave it for them. Like, you know, whatever is growing, if they want to eat, especially barbets love cocoa pods. So, yeah. <laughs> Great. Nina, thank you very much. You're this most welcome. It was nice meeting all of you. Thank you so much, Lakshmi, for calling me. Yeah. Uh, 
really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your uh, appreciation of my art. <laughs> uh, the pleasure is mine. Um, and I hope we cross paths again. And yes. That your paintings keep coming and keep touching our hearts. And yes, yes. The song words <laughs> and the bar bits and the and the grasses and the water bodies and anyone who needs a voice, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Bye, Lakshmi. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.